and I'm part of the URM um, foster care team. Now, the URM team is kind of unique in the, uh, the wider metropolitan area of, of Washington, D.C., as we're the only uh, foster care team that works exclusively with uh, youth uh, who are unaccompanied refugee minors. So these are youth who were not born in the U.S., who are coming uh, from abroad. They've left their country because it's not safe for them to remain there, and they've come to the U.S. to seek asylum or uh, to have a better life basically. We have about 20 kids in our program right now uh, and they are from a, a wide variety of backgrounds. We have kids from Central America, we also have kids from further afield from um, Ethiopia, Eritrea, Somalia, Afghanistan and uh, Myanmar and they're all placed with uh, foster homes uh, here in Washington DC and in Maryland as well. Um, and I'm really happy to say that we have one of our foster parents, oh, well, she's now retired after putting in a lot of service uh, and I hope she's enjoying um, a bit of more peace and quiet, but we're very happy to have Siobhan Bowman here with us today to speak to us a little bit about her fostering experience. So thank you for, for joining us today, Siobhan. Thank you for the warm greeting. Uh, okay, no problem. So I am a mother of four children that I birthed biologically, and I decided to foster slash adopt four additional children. So my family right now consists of three, two children in college, one graduated, uh, two children in high school, two children, three children out of high school. So I have a total of eight adults almost, two of them are teenagers, but they're soon to be adults. And my family within itself is just full of love, energy, and a lot of wows. <laughs> <laughs> so it's uh, eight in total? Eight in total. Okay, so it's, it's, a, it's a big family and it's a family that's expanded from your biological four kids into bigger. Absolutely. I will say this about my family. Um, three are refugees. Um, four, all four of them came from th Lutheran Social Services, but two of them are in the system, um, which is Abdul and Gilmar for being a refugee, well, yeah, for being a refugee, as well as Eric. Eric is not on paper legally mine, but because he doesn't have anybody here and he's been in our life for a long time, he will always be mine. And Kamor, but she was a, a CFSA child. Uh, so it was always my desire, just to let you know, for years when I grew up, my cousins, I had a large family, and so much my cousins chose to have babies a little bit early in their life, and they couldn't take care of them. So someone stepped to my family and said, I'll be a, a, of assistance for your cousins, and they took on my cousin's children. And I've always said when I got older that I want to do the same for somebody else because they were able to bless me. And then on top of that, my grandmother, that's all I saw growing up. She always had somebody child that she was taking care of. So naturally, that was something that I wanted to do. Um, and I also wanted to open a group home because originally um, foster care was not the first thing. It was I wanted to go big with it. But because DC stopped licensing me, um, they, li they stopped the licensing um, process when I got to the end. So I said, what better way to start without start, by starting in my home? So that's what we did. And it's been history since then. That's been since 2008, I think, 12 years. Yeah, 12 years. Um, what led me to the URM program was first the staff. Um, I will say it's a remarkable staff of Lutheran Social Services. Uh, the kids was already in my life already but the staff made a lot of difference for me. Um, with that being said, the children within the respect of traditional children versus refugees, um, in my experience, I would say that uh, the gratitude is greater. Um, sometimes uh, uh, I found when traditional children was to come in, they were so used to America and being spoiled in America uh, that you have a refugee child that comes in and they are just appreciative of everything. So for me, that was my wow, like just to see so much gratitude for just the smallest things. So yeah, so some they do have challenges, but I was willing to take on those challenges. So the first challenge is uh, a lot of things that you are accustomed to, they're not accustomed to. 
Um, this is one of my uh, children, which is Abdul. She has up on the screen. Um, when Abdul came to us, uh, he did not speak any English, okay? Um, it took him about six months. It took the system about six months to find a translator for him. That translator stayed in our lives for a whole year. So it was either I had, we all had to adapt and allow um, Abdul to adapt so that he can feel comfortable. He was saying little words, but he didn't really understand a lot of words. So it took, you had to have patience. You had to make sure you was persistent with teaching and you have to have hope. That's how I look at it. And with him, uh, this young man, <laughs> He has grown so much. He went to not speaking, not knowing what to do, how to clean up, what this was or what that was. Um, a lot of things because he didn't know how to speak to me. A lot of things I had to do with him was visual. I had to show him. I had to go do it and then he had to come back and do it. And he would ask me, was that correct? Yes. Um, the reason how Abdul got to me is because um, he was in a home where they did not appreciate, they did not uh, allow him to practice his religion. Abdul is Muslim. And I'm Baptist, um, so uh, the young, the person house he was at, he felt very uncomfortable because he was so accustomed to his practicing his religion. So you have to always be open to that. So I understood the difference between, um, and this was a challenge that I had to overcome myself because I'm, I'm real big on family doing everything together. We go to church, we go to parks, we go to uh, movies, we do everything together. So I had to adjust. And one of the largest adjustments for me was not having Abdul come with me to church. So he went to church a few times, but he really didn't like it. So at the end of the day, I said, as long as you believe in God, I'm gonna have to allow your God to be your God and my God to be my God. I have to respect this territory and understand that we don't practice the same. We don't, we don't, we don't pray, we praise the same God, but we don't practice the same. <laughs> so that was really hard for me as a parent because I am a religious person and I do believe in Christ. So, um, I accepted it because one one experience, one bad experience, well not bad experience, one experience that we had, um, and it touched my heart was when he called his translator. And his translator wasn't in our life for about a year after that, but he had went to church. I think we went on Easter or something. He was like, I don't want to go there. And he was just saying this. I was like, oh my gosh, I felt so bad. But ever since then, it's been good. So I just respect the fact that he, as long as he, know, he understands too, that he has to go to a mosque, but as long as he's praying, um, and doing what he needs to do to continue his relationship with God, I was fine with that. But that was one of the challenges besides the, the, the language barrier. So to expand a little bit more, um, we celebrate um, certain holidays. Of course, he didn't know, what, uh, he don't know, of course he doesn't know his birthday because they didn't keep records, but he don't celebrate a lot of holidays. He's now celebrating because he see everybody celebrating. Um, in, a different to that, in, in addition to that, the food. Uh, he came only wanting to eat halal meat. So I would go everywhere trying to find him halal meat to eat and couldn't find anything. Um, but he adjusted. Uh, another thing that he did uh, was he just, he had, to, uh, he had to adapt and we had to adapt to him as well because a lot of things that we do and we know or what's common sense to us, he didn't know that. So it was like, it even still like now to this day, when I do go to a hotel, We've been going to hotels for the last six years, okay? It's still like brand new, it's like Christmas to him. I'm like, Abdul, calm down. But because he's not accustomed to that, um, he's always excited. Everything, the smallest thing, always excited. If I leave him home because he had to work, uh, he'll get so upset. I'm like, Abdul, you had to work because uh, he wants to be there. He wants to be in the atmosphere. Another thing is uh, working, oh my goodness. His work ethic is absolutely amazing. So he has a job and he's been having his job since he was 16 years old, which he works at McDonald's. And when I tell you he don't like the mess work, and that's different from the traditional uh, child because my other traditional kids that I've had, I've had many, <coughs> almost had to beat work into them, not literally, but you know, keep preaching it over and over and over the importance of saving. He's a, a wonderful saver. He don't spend no money. I'm trying to now help him stop being so cheap. He cheaped himself, but he's a wonderful saver. Um, he always sends money back home to his family. That's very important to him. And that's, I mean, those are some of the differences that I see as far as traditional children, as well as you are young. So I will add to that um, a couple of things. One, 
uh, when foster parents are dealing with refugees, you have to go an extra step. So you have to have those patience, which means that uh, which means that Abdul don't do interviews well. So right now um, he has someone to help him with interviews. I think that's with uh, Brinkley's RSA. It's, it's, it's a company out here that we use, but it's with the company. I can't think of their name. I'm having a brain freeze. But um, he has to. They give him job training and everything. But in the beginning. I was the individual who was going with Abdul. I was the individual speaking to the supervisor, letting him know that he was from Burma and he doesn't speak English well, but I'm telling you that he will work extremely well. Like I did his interview for him. I did his application for him. And I have consistently done that. Right now he has an opportunity to work with Amazon and it's the same concept. I assisted him as well. So they need that handheld um, guidance. Uh, until they're able to make it on his own. But what I will say, that shift, that shift when he becomes a man and becomes an adult, I mean, I, me personally, I wasn't, I, I've never been the one with even my biological kids, and I'm making that difference for this reason, to say at 18 years old, 21, you gotta go. They're not in the system no more. No, it's time for you to be responsible. And what does responsibility look like? You paying bills, so yes, he pays me rent now. You being responsible for your own phone bill and everything else. Um, Cause I'm doing it again, cause I told you he didn't know how to uh, read and write really well. So now he's writing his own checks. I make him write me a check every month. I make him do the, the debit from his account. Um, so now I'll process with him because for me it's important. If you have any child and you're a foster parent, it's important to make sure you treat them like you actually had them because they already been treated bad in some kind of aspect. That's why they're in foster care. So by pushing them out, giving up on them, or wanting them to leave the house at a certain age, that may not be the best move if you're doing this actually for the child. So for me, um, I'm choosing to make my ch all my children, even biological, they have 21 years old. If they're in school, they can stay. Um, they have a year after that, and then it's time for us to look for a place for them. So within this year right now, we've already in the process of purchasing a house for Abdul to rent. Um, so he will be renting his own home and having his own space because you can't allow them to linger and leech onto, um, latch onto you for a long period of time because they have to go out and try on their own. But setting up that path for them to do it is very important as well. The language was the biggest surprise coming in. I will say that. I didn't, I didn't realize uh, we had to go through so many things, but I will tell you this good thing. That was about six years ago, okay? So my son to this day, he's about to take his citizen test. And I would challenge anybody on this call to ace him out because he has it down pat. I mean, word from word, all the information, he knows all his um, branches, he knows everything. So that to me moves me in a whole different kind of way because to see where he was at and where, he, where, where he's now, to be in every IEP meeting, which took him a long time to get, um, to see the serve the, the development that he had, that brings you that brings me a whole lot of joy. So I'm just really excited and looking forward to the opportunity when he can go take this test and become a citizen. Well, Gilmar, um, that's him. His, we call him G uh, for short. Uh, Gilmar G is originally from El Salvador. Um, he came over to the United States when he was about five years old. So he had a lot of American ways. So him, and I don't, I didn't have a picture of my other son, but he's in the first picture, which the whole family, which is Eric. Eric was from Honduras. Uh, go back to that, what, but, no, yeah. Well, Eric's back there with a hat on, um, that's Eric. So now I will say that, you know, even though, and that's, that's my child who may have went in a different route, because one thing for sure, is that when you are raised in a, a in poverty and you are raised where you know things you had to survive on your own, you it's hard for your mental mindset to understand how people want to actually help you. It almost seems like it's fate, but it's not fate. Um, and Eric is one of my children who, no matter how much help we tried to give him, he kept going left. So unfortunately, he's placed himself in a bad situation twice. He's been in prison twice. Um, he's in he's in a, um, a group home right now, and he I mean he comes back. We still are there for him. Uh, we try to direct him right back in the right places uh, so that he can continue to move forward because we are all he have. 
um, here. He's been in a lot of different foster homes, but he has had bad behavior. And his behavior was so bad because no one ever really actually cared and loved for him. So when we show him that love and that care, it was almost like, I'm gonna run away from it. Like, this is really real. This is really happening. Um, and he kept running away from us. He didn't want to stay here as many times that our doors was open for him. He didn't want, and he was out of the system. Um, we opened our doors to him too, so that he can try to do better because that's what we wanted to see him do better. But I'm just hoping that he gets it. So I, I said that to say that, you know, every child, you just got to be, have an open mind and, you know, have conversations because if you understand what they went through, if you understand their story, it may allow you to be a little bit more compassionate for them and to be a little bit more willing to help or to go that extra mile. But also you just have to have that balance too to make sure that you teach them to be the responsible adults they need to be as well. So discipline is important. Not physical, but discipline. And having structures and boundaries and knowing where, knowing what they, they, they can do and what they can't do. Correct, correct. And one of the things, which is Gilmar, I, I didn't finish saying, um, when I say he's so used to America, uh, Gilmar, uh, I have to set a lot of structures up for him. Um, meaning that uh, rules don't settle well with him. Like to, but I enforce them. And if, I, if, I'm, if I'm, I'm the one who's here taking care of you, that means I'm cutting off phones. I pay the networking here, the network get cut off, the TV get cut off, everything get cut off besides your food and your water. That's the only thing that you need. So at the end of the day, when you're an adult, you're not really feeling that. My, not, I'm only saying biological because they are my children, but I'm just making the difference. My biological kids are, have already been groomed into that. So they know and they see that they are already doing it. So sometimes you say, well, they doing it. She ain't gonna give me a pass. No, I'm not gonna give you a pass. It's gonna be the same thing. I'm gonna congratulate y'all the same and I'm gonna discipline y'all the same. So, but this particular young man, it was very hard for him for a very long time to adapt to rules and my other daughter, Kamora. But they eventually got it because I stood firm. I would, I would, I don't know if necessarily say it's a skill, but it's an intangible to keep an open heart, to make sure your heart and you are love, you are doing it for the right reason. You're doing it for people to actually grow, to um, thrive and to succeed. These are people's lives that you have in your hand. So you want to make sure that you're doing the best with them. Um, you know, if you had errors in your life, you know, don't make the same errors with them. And I all, I'm very uh, transparent. Like I don't sugarcoat nothing. I, I, I come straight. And when I come straight, they understand. Um, I'm not going, if it's the sex conversation, it's the alcohol conversation, it's the drugs conversation, it's the friends. It doesn't matter what the conversation is. We're going to have a conversation about it. So you can understand the pros and the cons of your decisions. After that is your choice. And you have to be mindful. And I tell my kids all the time, you know, make good choices so you can limit your regrets. So as a parent, I would just say, you know, keep that in mind going forward with any child. Those are some of the skills that you need to have. Don't beat around the bush with them. Be upfront and make, make their experience very memorable. You know, take the family pictures, uh, get, get them involved. Don't leave them, don't act, well, me personally, this is what works for me. I don't leave them with respite or when I go out of town or whatever. I take them with me. You know, they have to be involved with the family to understand that they are a part. You know, division is not, uh, not welcome in their lives, period. Because if you continue to divide them, they're not, you're not gonna build trust with them. Some foster parents say, this is my foster child uh and these are my children for you when every any time i've ever spoken to you you're like no these are my children yep i can't stand that i'm sorry if y'all do that <laughs> i can't stand that because i just look at it they have heard that you are labeling them that's like calling a female a dog or like calling a man out of his name like we know that you know that they're your foster children they know that but to tell everybody i mean aunt, uncle everybody cousin friend they don't have to continue to be labeled. They've already been labeled enough. That's your child. That's the person that you're taking care of. When you see them in the street, if they're no longer with you, that's still your child. So make them feel apart. Like if you can get away from that foster uh, care uh, label, it would definitely improve the relationship. Trauma informed training. I have been to trauma classes to learn how to deal with trauma kids, but to train people, no, I haven't. And I'm very active in the class because I've had all, all of my kids are trauma kids. Um, so uh, no training though. 
but you've you I think sorry the question was kind of like have you learned about trauma and how it uh, yes yes and I will say if you all are participants of Lutheran social services and even I don't know if you know if y'all still partner with CFSA um, now but those classes are amazing if you have your own child I learned so much by going to those classes I even how to treat my own children or how to respond to them just by understanding what how you think about a trauma person or what trauma people go through and just having an open mind to all of that those classes are amazing process can be long so just making sure you have all of your paperwork in line your home inspections done um i love the fact that lutheran offered training online because i can't tell you how difficult it was to get to a class so i like the fact that they get to split it you get i think 10 hours back then and 10 hours somewhere else so i did like that but I, that's, that's the gist of it. It could just be a long process. So have your patience packed because it could, especially if you're excited about getting a, getting a child, just pack on your patience and try to cross your eyes and cross your eyes, dot your eyes and cross your T's. <laughs> so in one of those pictures, my children were, were, was very young when I first got, um, when we first started doing foster care. And by the way, I, I, my husband was brought onto this uh, because of my heart. And he just went with the flow because um, he saw that it was something that I wanted to do. These four children, when I first started foster care, um, all the ba I used to have babies. So I wouldn't, I, I, me personally, I wanted to my kids to grow with them. Um, I didn't want a, a, a teenager at that particular time because uh, you have to be aware of which who you're bringing in your house too because their trauma can impact your children. But I figured if I have my children grow with them, we can interact and we can grow together. So when my children became teenagers, I branched from away from the babies and started looking at maybe a teenager to bring in. And I found that the need was really with the teenagers. But I will say this, my mistake as a parent that I hope no one makes this mistake, when you bring in your child, the new foster care child, don't just sit at the table with you and the husband. If you have a family, bring everybody to the table, sit together. So, and even if you make the decision to adopt or um, for uh, adopt or do guardianship, again, come back to the table together. My children, because they gonna have their differences and they have had a lot of them. But I'm always trying to bridge that gap and bring them back together. Like my kids, not, my kids being so exposed to so much stuff, not understanding what they haven't been exposed to. You had that conversation because it's like this. You have the conversation when, um, we have so much attitude on one side and these are females and the other ones don't like how you disrespect moms. That's a problem. So all these problems always fester up. It's always a, it's always a mentoring and coaching job that you have to do. But I will say that that's the only mistake that I did make because my, my husband and I was the only people at the table. My kids were walking and walk out, but they wasn't sitting down at that table understanding that person so that we could all have that connection and that vibe. It wasn't until my daughter got to college that she attended a class and she talked about her family and I just cried for three days. I opened up the uh, email and I cried and I cried, my biological child, so you could know. Um, I cried for three days because I never had the opportunity to ask them or to ask her particularly um, how she felt about anything that I did. Even though her story was awesome in the end, you know, she grew, but it was the fact that I just didn't incorporate her and that did hurt her feelings. So. If I, if I had to take it all back, all my kids would be at the table with us so they can all see. So that would be the only thing.